Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value and the Ferris Report, both published by Stansberry Research. Today, we'll talk with dyed-in-the-wool value investor Tobias Carlisle. He's been on the show before. We have to check in with him. We'll also talk about Mr. Market versus the smart money. And if you want to talk to us, you can email us at feedback at investorhour.com and tell us what's on your mind. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. Mr. Market versus the smart money. What in the world am I talking about? Well, it was partially the subject of a recent Stansberry Digest, which I write once a week, usually on Fridays. And it started because... I, I just I wanted to look up this one quote by um, the very famous value investor guru. He is known for his tutelage of Warren Buffett, among other things, Benjamin Graham, right? Very famous, the guy who basically gave birth to value investing. And I wanted to look up this one quote because it is very often that people will say, you know, Ben Graham said the stock market is a voting machine in the short term and a weighing machine in the long term. And I hadn't read this part of the book in many years. And the book is Security Analysis. It was first published in 1934. And I went and looked it up and I thought I really should get the quote from the original source. And it doesn't say anything like that. In fact, I'll read you the quote and then we'll talk about it. It says this In other words, the market is not a weighing machine on which the value of each issue is recorded by an exact and impersonal mechanism in, a, in accordance with its specific qualities. Rather, should we say that the market is a voting machine where on countless individuals register choices, which are the product partly of reason and partly of emotion. So he says it, the market is not a weighing machine. It's just a voting machine all the time, short term, long term, all the time. And I think people use that short-term, long-term thing because the tendency is to think that, well, over the long term, you know, the value of a business, right, the business underlying the stock um, will be reflected in the market price of the stock, right? Like, and, and our, our friend Whitney Tilson does this, among other people. I've seen he puts up a slide now and then that tracks his estimate of the intrinsic value of Berkshire Hathaway and the share price of Berkshire Hathaway. And the core of the method for valuing Berkshire Hathaway comes from Warren Buffett. He, so he's told you how to do it many times over the years. And then Whitney adds his own changes to that. So they track each other over time. You say, see that? Over time, the market is sort of a weighing machine, weighing the real value, reflecting the real value of the business. But I, I think that's an unusual case. I think there are a lot of businesses whose value doesn't change like not nearly as much, not nearly as much as the stock market says it does. And not only that, but if you look at these episodes that I've been talking about a lot in the past year, like from 1929 to 1954, um, throughout the, like from late sixties to early eighties, um, the NASDAQ from 2000 to 2015, the, the stock market went sideways in all those cases. It just kind of went into a, a, a multi-year, you know, decade plus, two decade plus funk. And, you know, I don't think the valuations, like if you look at the valuations in the 70s, for example, it's an anomaly. Like if you get a chart of the S&P 500's price to earnings ratio, the 70s are like this cheap period that's below 15 times earnings and all the rest of it's above 15 times earnings. So you know, where was the value of those businesses? And you can say, well, you know, inflation adjusted, blah, 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 blah. You know, it was much more complicated than that. It was inflation from late 60s, early 70s. Then it was a recession. Stock market crashed in 74. And then away we went with more inflation. And then, of course, Paul Volcker took the Fed funds rate up to 20%. Like there were all these huge changes. And I think the voting machine what happens is the voting machine gets ahead of itself, 
right? And you have these huge run-ups, right? Um, late 60s, early 70s, and then boom, boom, crash in 1974. Late 90s, boom, crash starting in, in March of 2000 through late 2002, et cetera, right? And then the market, like the fear is not easily removed because people got so, so optimistic in all those cases in 2000, 1929, and in you know late 2021, early 2022 when those when the current market peaked and it really all throughout 2021 it was just amazing one thing peaked after another and people were just so elated to have all these assets and then they started falling apart but then what comes after that is sort of it takes a while to get all that optimism beaten out of people and then the market goes sideways for many, many years. So you get this brutal bear market and then sideways action. I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen because nobody knows the future, but I think it's highly likely that that's the outcome we're looking at. And I look at the market and I say, well, it's, it's just reflecting people's emotions. You know, it's not reflecting, it's not weighing each business. It's not weighing the intrinsic value of these businesses. So it's a very emotional mechanism, right? And there's another quote from another Ben Graham book, um, The Intelligent Investor, which first came out in like 1949, I think. And he described the stock market as Mr. Market. And here's a quote about that. He says, imagine that in some private business, you own a small share that cost you $1,000. One of your partners named Mr. Market is very obliging indeed. Every day he tells you what he thinks your interest is worth and furthermore, either offers to buy you out or sell to you an additional interest on that basis. Sometimes his idea of value appears plausible and justified by business developments and prospects as you know them. Often, on the other hand, Mr. Market lets his enthusiasm or his fears run away with him, and the value he proposes seems to you a little short of silly. So two traits define Mr. Market, which is the, the stock market, right? Um, this mechanism that he says is basically a voting machine based on people's emotions. Two things define Mr. Market. He's very obliging indeed, meaning he's like a very active trader and he is manic depressive. <laughs> like sometimes he's, he's on an emotional high, like in 2021. And then sometimes, you know, the lows get the better of him. Like, you know, at the bottom in 2002 or the bottom in, in early 2009, those times. So he's, he, he's basically an overactive, manic, depressive trader, right? Now, you can probably agree with me about this, right? The, obviously, the stock market is just, it soars and crashes, or, or rather, it, it rises and falls, and sometimes it soars and crashes based on headlines, which are often just plain wrong, you know, let alone irrelevant to a particular business. And it's clearly an emotional roller coaster. That is an easy enough thing to understand, right? But it doesn't square. Like the reason it irritates me is it doesn't square at all with this other view of the stock market, which is that it's a discounting mechanism. It's looking forward and it's thinking about how the, all the current events are going to affect all the companies in the market. And it is discounting that likely future. It's forward looking. Surely you've heard this before, right? People talk about the market as a future discounting mechanism. And discount is finance jargon. It just means like, in this case, it means something like it predicts the future. It discounts the future. You got it? So do you really think that an overactive, manic, depressive trader is good at seeing the future? I mean, maybe some kind of crazy savant, you know, sitting in a room somewhere. But I don't think the stock market is that. I don't think it really knows anything about the future. Like, it's not discounting reality. Like, you know, at the peak in, in February 2021, when Kathy Wood's ARK Innovation ETF had just gone up like 350% or some crazy amount, something like that. It was crazy amount in a very short period of time, like 11 months or something. <laughs> what was being discounted then? It seems to me like miracles happening, you know, unreality, all these cash burning businesses, most of which aren't going to exist in a few years 
were being assessed by this overactive manic depressive trader to be the greatest thing in the world worth more than you would ever dream they would be worth is it wasn't it, it's insane and i think it happens all the time i think that's the way the market mostly is it's mostly a little crazy and i mean i'm just left sort of and i'm left thinking about the bond market too cuz the bond market is called the smart money right these are people who they're senior to all the equity holders in the world, right? Bonds get paid before, and bond interest gets paid before anything is paid out to any equity holders. That's the way it always is. And so they're the smart money, right? They know. And, and we know what they're thinking because they, a lot of them go into the futures market and they hedge interest rate risk and do all kinds of smart things, right? But if you go in the futures market and look at like, you know, the, the spreads of the Fed funds futures, this is like the most watched interest rate in the world, just about, you know, next to the 10 year treasury, maybe everybody on earth wants to know what the federal reserve is going to do with the Fed funds rate. When they say the feds raising rates or cutting rates or whatever, they mean the Fed funds rate. And there's a whole futures market. I mean, it has the name future in it that is devoted towards figuring out what the the price is going to be what the what the rate is going to be in months and months from now so i recently looked at the spread between the april contract and the december contract this year and it looks like something a toddler drew in the refrigerator with a sharpie when his mom wasn't looking just scribbles meaning the chart is all over the place it plunges and it soars and it plunges again it's it's insane no the the market doesn't know it's not discounting anything. So like when people say, well, the market seems to be telling us this or the market seems to be telling us that. I mean, I guess that's an honest way to put it. Seems to be telling us because it's not really telling us anything except what everybody feels like right now. Everybody feels like the Fed funds rate is going to go up or down. Everybody feels like this stock is worth this and that stock is worth that. But it's not an objective assessment at all. It's emotional. It's based on all kinds of things. People buy and sell for all kinds of reasons. And I just think that, you know, there, there are people who make a lot of money doing a lot of fancy math on, on securities prices and commodity prices and things. You know, God bless them. I'm not a physicist. I don't know how to do that work. And I know few, few people like, I don't know that I've ever actually met anyone. Maybe one guy. We, well, we had Mike Harris on the show, didn't we, recently? He knows how to do that kind of stuff, but he wouldn't tell you it's easy. I'll tell you that. He's constantly pointing out that all the folks who are supposed to know how to do this stuff, you know, they aren't making a lot of money lately. And, you know, there's a firm here and there like Renaissance Technologies. You've probably heard of them. They've made something in one of their accounts. They've made something crazy like 80% a year for a long time. And maybe you've heard of Jim Simons, the guy who founded that firm. Okay, well, that's one, right? That's one. <laughs> See if we can find another one. You know, the point is like, you're not going to predict, you're not going to use current stock prices to predict anything. You think you are, but you're probably not. And this goes back to my basic advice that I've been hammering on for the last couple of years. Prepare, don't predict. You know, Mr. Market is too emotional and he's too irrational. And I've even heard people recently say, you know, this market is too crazy to trade. I hear a lot of traders saying this is this is a little bit too crazy to trade. And I'd heard that I'd heard people say that in the past. I I feel like I'm hearing it more now than I did in the past, okay? But I've heard it a lot lately and I've and I've even heard it many times over the years. So, it happens, right? Really really good traders can look at a market and say, you know, something there's nothing to do here. Or this action is too crazy. You know, my my system or my methods or whatever don't really do anything for me here. So you know, you 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 got to be careful out there. Try not to trade too much. I think it's a disadvantage. We disadvantage ourselves by trading too much, and it's better, I think, to prepare rather than try to predict and trade on your prediction. So you prepare by doing what? Well. In your equities portfolio, you buy really good businesses and you hold on to them for a long time until maybe you've made a lot of money and you're older and you want to enjoy your money. Or <clears throat> maybe 
you know, you need the money for a surgery or something, or, or maybe your kid's going to college, you know, some reason like that after you've compounded for many, many years, right? Or, or maybe you were wrong and the business is all of a sudden not so great. But I don't think the difficult part is identifying the great businesses. I really don't. I think the difficult part is hanging on to them through volatile, difficult times. Um, <clears throat> so in your equities, you know, hang on to great businesses for a long time. And then the rest of it, I think you really need to hold some gold, probably gold and silver. I think that you need to hold plenty of cash. Um, cash is an option. It's a call option on all the stuff you're going to buy, all the stuff you're waiting to get dirt cheap and really attractive or whatever you're waiting for. Some people are waiting for uh, downtrends to turn into uptrends. Um, Steve Sugarwood has this mighty triumvirate that he's used for decades now. Cheap, hated, and in an uptrend. So he's, you know, he would be he would be a guy who would be holding his cash, waiting for that moment to arrive. Whatever whatever it is you're looking for, the only way you're going to take advantage of it is if you have enough cash on hand to do it. So you hold plenty of cash. And aside from that, it's all you, man. Whatever you got. If you're a if you're a guitar collector and you think you can add a lot of value to your portfolio by buying a bunch of guitars or fancy cars or art or any of that crazy stuff. That's up to you. That's based on your knowledge. But I think your core is really good businesses in your equities, plenty of cash and some gold and silver for the reasons that we've discussed here today, because you don't want to trust an overactive, manic, depressive trader with your money. All right. A very rational guy is our guest today. Tobias Carlisle. He is a dyed-in-the-wool value investor. We'll talk about his methods and the screen that he uses and all kinds of good stuff and whatever he likes today. And we'll do it right now. Let's do that. Let's talk with Tobias Carlisle right now. It's official. Mark Chaikin just went live with the biggest prediction of his career. A new wave of volatility is coming for the stock market, and investors need to act immediately. Mark's prediction is based on an indicator that has only triggered a handful of times in the last 72 years with a 100% success rate for predicting where stocks will go next. During Mark's 50-year career, he's worked alongside some of the biggest investors in history, including Paul Tudor Jones and Michael Steinhardt. In fact, Mark invented one of Wall Street's most popular indicators for picking stocks, still used today by hedge funds, banks, and brokerage sites, and also is found on every Bloomberg terminal on the planet. Now Mark's inviting you to watch his brand new event as he explains exactly what the next wave of volatility will look like and where it will send stocks in the coming weeks. He's even sharing one of his favorite ideas for free for those who tune in. He says this idea could create bigger gains than anything he's used his power gauge system for until now by turning the coming market volatility to your advantage. But Mark says you must act today before more volatility hits the market. To watch his newest prediction in full, go to shakinevent23.com. That's C-H-A-I-K-I-N event23.com. Toby, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Dan. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Um, I, I feel like if I haven't checked in with you, I'm I'm sort of uh, I'm not doing my job. Um, <laughs> well, you know, there aren't a lot of real value folks left. That's kind of good because it's easy to keep track of every single one of you, right? <laughs> so. it's, it's well, it's it's definitely true. There aren't very many left. I think that period through 19 and 20 was so painful for most for many value guys. You just can't help but drift towards the growthier stuff, the compounded type stuff. And it's always the way. The opportunities are always where everybody's not looking, which is value investing, which is why you've got to be careful not to drift, particularly as a value investor. You want to be at the least attractive, including the strategy, the least attractive part of the strategy. So it's no surprise that just as everybody hates oil and gas and energy, oil goes negative on the day. You remember that when the barrel of oil traded negative? Probably the best time yep. to buy oil, energy stocks in a long period of time. And here we are, we're still mm -hmm. underinvested in the in the sector, still a pretty good time to buy them, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And 
I actually, I tried to go long oil in the futures market that day, but they wouldn't take the order. So really, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was trying to go long that contract. So that was, you know, I think it. I think that was the last day of that contract. Yeah, maybe. yeah. Um, so you know, <laughs> I was really, I was like, how could this possibly go wrong? You know, um, getting paid to to hold a barrel of oil. <laughs> You had to stick it in a facility, a regulated facility. Oh, I thought the same thing. Stick it in the pool. So, you know, barring that kind of eventuality, where else might one look today if one is a real, a, you know, an honest to goodness value guy like yourself? I think you always want to look where, well, I don't, I don't, my approach to it is completely ad hoc and bottoms up. So I, mm-hmm. I'm just looking for the cheapest, I just screen for the cheapest stuff in the market. And my screen is, uh, the acquirer's multiple, which is on one side, it's looking at enterprise value, which is market capitalization plus debt. So it includes all of the liabilities that you should look at when you're buying a company because you can find some companies out that have got huge amounts of debt on the balance sheet and you're not getting, you may not be getting compensated for taking on that debt risk. And then on the other hand, mm-hmm. I want to see how much I'm earning in terms of operating income, which is pretty much close to the top. That's revenues. Then you take out COGS, that gives you gross profits. And then you're looking for operating income which is uh, just taking out the a few other bits and pieces at the top. So you're basically looking at, it's the accounting version of cash flow, essentially cash from operations. And I right. prefer the accounting version to the, to the actual cash flow measure because that's reconstructed from the accounting version anyway um, by adding back in various things. So I use mm-hmm. those two metrics. I just look for which things are you paying the least for to get the most out of. When you do that process and you look through those screens, every single one of the names in the list has a very substantial problem that everybody's aware of, which is why they get so cheap, of course. And for a long time, it was energy. It still continues to be energy and oil and gas, even though they've mm-hmm. um, they've had a pretty good run. The sector yeah. is, as a whole is underinvested for a variety of reasons. Some of them are ESG related that there are so many people, that, funds that have just divested completely from the sector, which if you're a capital cycle theory person, as I am, uh, it just stands to reason if energy needs, uh, you can look back 10 years and see how much energy we were consuming. Have a look yeah. how much energy we're consuming now. It's up about 70%. Yeah. Have a look how much we're going to be consuming in the future. It's growing parabolically. At some point, we're probably going to run out of oil. I hope it doesn't happen during my lifetime, but at some point that happens. Hmm. I hope it doesn't happen during my kid's lifetime either. But yeah, I, would, I wouldn't worry too much about it. We are massively underinvested yeah. in that sector. And it's going to need a lot of investment. You can compare, so often people will say, well, look at what happened in 2008 to energy. Like energy, it was an energy spike in 2007. It was an oil pro- spike in 2007 that spiked the entire economy. That's what kicked us off into this uh, mess, into that mess. Mm-hmm. And then energy didn't perform very well through it. But it was a completely different scenario because it had been a decade or more of pretty heavy en- investment into energy. It was overinvested. Mm-hmm. They were over. They were spending way too much money. All the sort of things that happen at the top of the cycle. This is the other end right. of the cycle. We're at the bottom. We've only just started investing more as a portion of the entire market. It's still very small relative to what it has been on average. So I think energy is one of the more obvious places at the moment. I completely agree, and and all the same thing. I, I made a list of all those reasons why energy continues to be a good bet. Um, you know, despite the really nice run that it's had already, mm. and. I feel like, you know, we got a little bit of confirmation from this move across the OPEC countries recently, but I don't count on anything like that. To me, that's not a a big fundamental driver. The fundamental driver, I totally agree, is the the underinvestment in supply and then the ongoing demand. And especially like the, you know, this idea like we're all going to be driving electric vehicles. And we're all going to be using solar panels and all that kind of thing. I think it's just so dramatically overstated. The expectations are off the charts compared to what's actually required to make all that happen. Undeniably true. But also, the very beginning of our food, you know, the Malthusians got laughed at. So Thomas, uh, Malthus, I'm saying Thomas, I'm not sure if that's true. Malthus, in like 1798, he says, energy consumption growing geometrically the rate at which we're growing food, growing um, arithmetically because it's just, you know, it's surface area of the, of the ground. Mm-hmm. When you look at the reasons why we've been able to grow the amount of food that we do and keep up with consumption, it's because we've got so much better at sticking 
fertilizer into the ground at the beginning of the process? What's the key ingredient into fertilizer? Well, it's nitrate that comes out of natural gas. Which is, and that's one of the all-time great advances in human technology was the figuring that out. So we're going to pull that out of the food supply. There's not going to be very many of us here. Yeah. We, we can do all of those things that they're saying, it's just we can't do it with 8 billion people in the world. We can do it with many, many fewer. Right. And of course, you know, if you were my sort of uh, down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theorists, guests uh we we might talk about people who really would like to see that reduction but uh, i don't know we probably think, shouldn't go there i think you hear like i think lots of people are trying to do the right thing and they they're told that all of these things are a threat but they haven't thought through to the end point of it which is that there have got to be lots and lots fewer people and if that's the case then i say you go first then i'll reassess it after you're gone and I'll figure it, I don't mean you personally, I mean people making that argument, they can go first and then Absolutely. the rest of us who are still here will assess what's important. Yeah, so um, along these lines, you know, speaking of a dramatic trend of underinvestment and much more demand, what about mining? You know, things like copper. We just haven't found big new copper mines and if, if the electric vehicle folks get their way, if the projections come anywhere near true, we're going to be needing like a brand new Escondida copper mine, biggest copper mine in the world, you know, at least every year, or every few years or something, uh, starting within the next decade. So, Well, another great point, like how much earth we shift now as a result of fossil fuels dwarfs what we used to do in the past. And all of those things, iron or copper, any, just take your pick, all of them are just shift huge amounts of earth to yield a tiny little bit of the metal at the end of it. So what mm. we're saying is we're not going to do that anymore. All of these things are achievable. It's just that there are going to be many fewer of us living at a much lower level of civilization. Well, I certainly don't want that. <laughs> Me either. I like the, I like what's going on now. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's another trend we can talk about. That I'm a value guy left. too, by the way. These are, these are big macro issues. I just, I just yeah. it, have to investigate these things and think about them because they influence everything that we do. Mm -hmm. We're not getting off any of that. There's really, there's no way. Even going completely nuclear, which there doesn't seem to be much nobody really wants to do that. I think that's probably a great idea. It's probably necessary that we do go heavily nuclear. Mm -hmm. That doesn't solve most of the problems. Oil and gas is used for other things throughout the throughout the economy. It solves the en some of the energy problem. It gets clean water because we've got desalination plants. We can power our, power our houses and our factories, maybe power our cars. But, you know, planes probably won't fly. Energy density right. of a battery relative to what it lifts, the technology is just not there. It's miles and miles away. Right. I just recently read up on a little bit of this and I was shocked, you know, the, the amount of... The, the weight of batteries needed to get like an electric aircraft off the ground is just like, you know, <laughs> for like work. a commercial airliner. Yeah, not doable. Um, you know, it's like just not doable. So let's talk about something, you know, folks don't seem to want to own recently. Banks. I mean, um, banks look rough to a lot of people, of course, because a couple of them failed recently. Banks are tough. So let's talk about banks a little bit. Joel yeah. Greenblatt, who did some analysis on quantitative investment strategies, excluded banks, ex excluded financials and utilities from his analysis. Utilities because they can play with what your earnings. If you start mm -hmm. over-earning, they just cut back the amount that you're earning. Financials, the problem is that it's, just, it's essentially a black box. You don't really know what the, the assets look like because they could be – I mean, the big problem in the States at the moment Relative to where we were pre-pandemic, office occupancy is 50% what it was. And so office has, commercial real estate office has two problems. One is secular and one is cyclical. The secular one is more and more people want to work from home. And I can't blame them. People want them back in the office. People don't want to go. There'll be a, some tension there and it'll be resolved at some point. But it's hard to see how we get from 50% to 100%. That's a very big gain and we're pretty well post the worst of the lockdowns and so on. So it's now a choice. It's not, it's not mandated. And the other one is a cyclical component where we're probably close to, well, we're closer to the end of the business cycle. I don't think we've actually seen the recession yet, but all of the indicators that I look at tell me that we're mm -hmm. either right in it or we're all of the leading and coincident indicators tell me that we're right in it. The lagging indicators haven't fallen over yet, but they wouldn't have if it was 2008 either. So we're, we're not quite there yet. When that happens, then there are going to be layoffs. There are going to be 
there's going to be less commercial real estate and office required. All of those assets have backing debt against them. All of that debt is held by regional banks. And so you've got to be very, very careful when you're looking through regional banks what the composition of their loan books looks like. The other thing is just as a general philosophical point, I like Terry Smith, Fund Smith in the States, very well, uh, in the UK, very well known quality investor, was the best banking analyst in the UK for like 12 years running. He doesn't have a single bank in his portfolios. And he says the two <laughs> things aren't unrelated. He actually understands them, so he finds them hard to invest in. I don't, help, I don't hold any at the moment. I just, I think there will, there will come a time, but I think I just want to see the cycle flush properly before we get to the other side and have a look. Do you hold something? Makes sense, yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm thinking about it, but I just, um, I don't know. I don't see it right now. And, and I've always, I've long had the black box issue, you know, uh, and our, our other guest um, recently on the podcast was Kevin Duffy. And he says, it's okay to run a levered hedge fund, but don't call it a bank. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's the best way to do it. Yeah. You get bailed yeah. out by the government when you go wrong. Yeah, that's right. Whoops. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Whoops, and we still get paid. Um, my way of, of looking into banks lately, I, I thought, hmm, let me take a look at the list of domestic systemically important financial institutions and see Which who's one of on those there. Is <laughs> yeah. See if like M and T Bank is on there. Yeah. You know, they've been pretty well run over yeah. the years. Yeah, that's um, right. There are a few others. So I was like, well, you know, if that's what I need to get, to make the bet in the first place, eh, maybe not such a great bet. M and T's a great example of a good bank. I think Jamie Diamond runs a good bank too. All of those got many of those mm-hmm. guys who survived two thousand eight better able to think about the downside risks and seem to have prepared for them a little bit. And M&T have done a great job mm-hmm. too, according to their, that most recent annual report that they released. But you can look mm-hmm. at many of the other ones, and I can't blame them for this either because it wasn't that long ago that we were talking very seriously about negative rates in the States being a possibility because the rest there were $20 trillion of negative rates around the world. Like all of the leading um, sort of developed countries around the world seem to be close to negative rates. So when they were getting a little bit of yield, considering that we might go negative, those, those did seem like pretty attractive. You know, the, the, the true blame for this lies at the feet of the Fed. And I don't think it's the current guy either. I think he's doing the best with what he can. I think it's the mm-hmm. two priests, Benalin, but Yellen and Bernanke, right. uh, just pinning rates at zero for way too long has created all of this silliness. Jay Powell's got, can't, hands are kind of tired. He's got to get those rates up before they lower them again. It's got to happen too. Right. Right. He's, I mean, he's barely back to something that we could consider historically anyway, normal. Right. Not even the long run average yet. Yeah. We're not, that's Still right. We're not average. at 6%. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. When you look at it that way, when you take a long view of it, um, it looks a lot different. And I totally agree. We've been talking about this recently, how, you know, Warren Buffett says you learn who's been swimming naked when the tide goes out, but it's not the tide's fault. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's it's the swimming naked that got you in trouble. So they were always like that. They were always swimming naked, and that was one of the things M and T avoided was you know right. loading up on securities at like the lo- literally the lowest interest rates in recorded history. Right, it's tough though um, because I I can see it from their perspective. I do understand it from their perspective, but they they're, they're getting flushed yeah, out now. They are getting flushed out, and and I, yeah, I I appreciate the perspective too. It's like we're paid to dance, you know, in Chuck Prince's old formulation of that attitude is we're paid to dance we got to get up and dance as long as the music's playing well music stopped so (laughs) (laughs) there's there's no more of that anymore but yeah it's a it's a tough one i agree banks are a tough one i sort of i sort of did that to you on purpose i admit i have held them in the past and i I don't have anything against them i'm not quite as uh anti them as terry smith and greenblatt and some of those guys are but i just look for really offside opportunities where i'm really confident that there's no zero risk there and that the upside is overcompensated and for me at the moment it's just knowing what the composition of loan books in aggregate looks like and the problems with particularly commercial real estate and i'm sure coming up soon residential real estate and then you think about where all of those loans are held all of those the 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 regional banks are the ones that are most dependent upon those loans that's makes up the bulk of their loan books so those are the ones that will be most dangerous so I agree. I was just about, before you said it, I was just about to say I would go through and look at, I'd be more inclined to look at the bigger ones 
right now than than the lower ones if you had to than the small ones but i don't i don't have any I, i'm just they're just not coming into my screen universe at the moment so i'm not worrying about them too much fair enough and and i'm actually i'm kind of happy to hear it <laughs> you know um so let's see we've covered well we, we we've been through banks and uh mining and how and about just and the gas. economy generally how about let's what about so i think sure. one really important uh, metric or that I like looking at is the yield curve inversion. Um, so Cam Harvey wrote his PhD dissertation in 1986. He didn't have much history to go back on. He had four recessions before he he wrote his PhD in 1986 to look at. And the each of those recessions was preceded by a yield curve inversion. So ordinarily the yield curve, the shorter dated treasuries – so the three-month trade with a smaller coupon, traded with a uh, lower interest rate relative to the 30-year backdated treasury, which have a higher interest rate to compensate you for inflation risk, uh, just the risk that the government goes bankrupt, you know, all of those other just general economic risks. And so ordinarily, the yield curve is uh, lowest at the front and highest at the back. And so this time around, because we've gone through an inversion, it's basically we're in contango, which means at the front of the yield curve, people are more worried about immediate uh, issues than they are about issues that are 10 years out. So they're demanding more of a premium for short-term money than they are for 10-year money, and that's called an inversion. And we're, we are at the steepest inversion we've ever seen. And when I say ever, this, this data only goes back to 1980 that I can find on the, on the SEC's uh, website, on the free data website. Since Cam Harvey wrote, so Cam Harvey's picked every single recession and he's never had a false positive in the data to 1986. Since 1986, it's picked every single recession and it's never had a false positive, including the 2020, the March 2020 recession. It was, there was a lot of weakness around and the yield curve was indicating that there was an issue and sure enough, it happened. The catalyst is probably COVID, but there was clearly some weakness in the system before that happened. Here we are again with this incredibly steep inversion. The curve inverted on October 25, 2022. In Cam Harvey's analysis, he says that the shortest period of time from an inversion to the declaration of a recession, because that's the for official purposes, it doesn't happen until it's declared, was seven months. The, the longest period of time was 15 months and the average is 12 months. So if you think about what that means this time around, that means a recession could be declared any time from May 25 at the earliest, October 25 this year on average, and uh, January 25 at the latest, so January 25, 2024. So I think that if you look at all of the leading and coincident indicators they also agree with that so the ism manufacturing came out today it shows a contraction um orders uh, seem to be indicating some sort of contraction we've seen housing go orders have gone p for profitability is the next one and then uh, employment is the final lagging indicator typically when employment cracks that's closer to the bottom that's a good time to get long because the the market is a forward-looking um, discounting machine. So I think that we're, we're standing right on the precipice of some declaration about the recession. I think that will impact the stock market when it happens. And then we might have three to six months of carnage and hopefully nearer towards the mm -hmm. end of the year, we'll probably find a bottom and bounce. So that's, that's sort of my, that's my rough guess for what happens over the course of this year because of the underlying weakness in the economy. How do you feel about that? Um, I don't think we disagree much there, but I, I want to get to a specific question about this because Mr. Bottom Up Value Guy, <laughs> who is, we're all forced to think about these macro things, right? But Bottom Up Value Guy, I need to ask you, um, you've given me your view, but like, do you, are you allocating capital based on any of this or do you just stick to, you know, Stick to your guns. You don't worry about your macro forecast. What do you do? You actually do anything with this macro forecast with real dollars? No, very fortunately for me, I don't do any asset allocation. I'm only in the stock picking business. Asset allocation, uh, I can't figure out how to do it with any kind of um, consistency or certainty. So, no, I'm I'm always fully invested long in my value strategies, and I don't really worry about 
what happens. I just talk about it because it saves me from talking about what's in the portfolio all the time because I have my own little podcast and I have to talk about something on a weekly basis. And that I think is an interesting – it's an interesting uh, thing to consider because there's this idea in a lot of the social science research that simple statistical models, simple quantitative models outperform experts – and that continues to be true even when experts get the output from the simple quantitative models. And I just think it's interesting to see <laughs> the success that this thing's had. Fair enough, it's only had a handful of opportunities. It's, it's got the N is equal to eight. There have only been eight recessions in the period of time that Cam Harvey examined. And since he published his research in 86, there have been another four. So it doesn't happen very often, but it doesn't invert very often either. And so I think it's interesting that the moment that it inverts, every single commentator on the economy says, no, you can ignore that one safely. The, here are the reasons why that's not going to work this time around. It happens every single time. And I just find it interesting that it has such a great record and everybody's just, everybody's so anti it. But I, I don't think you can ignore it. I think you have to look at it and say, what is the impact that this will have on each of my holdings? What will mm -hmm. it do to their businesses? I don't think you can necessarily escape the business cycle in your businesses. I think that they're subject to it as much as anything else. That was the argument for a while that the fang socks were going to be uh, able to skate over the top of the, the business cycle. But I think they're subject to it. I think we're slowly seeing that they're subject to it. Earnings are going to come down at the S&P 500 over the next few quarters at least. And I think that a lot of the reason, the triggering point is it's not the 10-3 inversion. The triggering point is just general slowing in the economy, which may turn up as a recession. Not that there's, not that there's anything magical about a recession either. It's just or the, the definition used to be two quarters of negative growth, but I guess the definition has changed to something else now. I know. But when that happens, there's nothing magic about that. We've clearly got a slowing economy. I think most people can feel it. How does that turn up in my portfolio? It's only in my examination. So I try to avoid things that are too economically sensitive. Uh, and there are lots of business models like that that are very, very sensitive to the downside of the uh, cycle, including financials. Yeah. And to be fair, commodities, oil, et cetera. I mean, true. You know, those things are sensitive. And so, and I've, I've tried to make it clear to my listeners and subscribers that uh, I'm bullish on those things longer term, but shorter term, get ready for a rocky ride because it's know, never it's really any other kind of ride. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's never any other kind of ride with those stocks. Um, okay. So you don't want to talk about what's in your portfolio, but. I guess we've covered some sectors that I can you talk sort about some like. things. Some things that okay. So I bought I bought Facebook. Uh, I don't know exactly how long I've held it for, but maybe not quite a year. Coming up on that sort of period of time, because I only look at the financial statements. I'm not. I don't spend a lot of time. I think that businesses are to some extent unpredictable, and better businesses that look like they're better businesses. There's a lot of competition for those extra returns. So Meta just seems to me like one of those businesses where it has been very dominant for a very long period of time, but clearly TikTok, the Chinese spy app, is quite good at attracting attention from kids where the attention goes, the advertising dollars goes, and that's bad for Facebook if that happens. So I, um, I'm aware that that is happening, and I see Meta got very cheap as a result based on its historical performance. And so when, when I looked at it, I saw that users are still growing, revenues are still growing. The bottom line is looking a little bit uglier because they've been investing huge amounts of money into the metaverse and all of the, um, whatever that investment entails, lots of, lots of servers and so on, lots of space. And uh, I think that that spooked the market when they saw the numbers that were coming out. And so Twitter got sold off very, very heavily. And I have bought it on the way down purely for the reason that I think it's way too cheap. If it can continue to earn what it has earned in the past, it's way too cheap. Even if it diminishes a little bit over the next few years, it's still way too cheap. It's basically a bet that the past looks more like the future than sort of what everybody else expects the future to look like. So I think Meta's one that I have owned. I still think it's, it's still too cheap. I think it was about half price when I bought it. It probably traded down to like one third of what I thought it was worth by the time it actually found its. But I think it was worth about three hundred. I think I bought it at one fifty. I think it traded under one hundred for a period of time there. Okay. And so I still think it's too cheap where it is. But I think Meta is a good example of the kind of things that we will buy. They're a little bit not not so much unknown, but you know, uh, disliked for for the obvious reasons. 
You got any Facebook? You don't like the mind control machine? <laughs> no, I, I do like the mind control machine. I think, um, as, in fact, I, I think it's kind of indisputable that these advertising-based businesses, Facebook and Google, are some of the most incredible businesses that have ever been created in in all of history. You know, the way they gush cash earnings um, over almost any period of time is just your dream, right? That's why we want to own assets because they gush lots of excess cash. And and these do it like, you know, few if any others. Um, they're like a royalty on the economy, on people buying stuff, um, on spending. So, yeah, I think they're pretty incredible. You know, and I, I, I don't expect like the government to do anything about them. There's a lot of talk about, well, they're monopolies and they... You know, social media is bad for kids in the case of Meta um, because my view of that is that it's sort of like, you know, when, when Microsoft was having that problem of including the browser with, you know, back in, what was that, like 1998 or something? It was a long time ago. And I thought, well, that's the one that taught me, actually. I didn't think it at the time, but that's the one that taught me, well, when they start coming after you for these, um, you know, market control complaints, that's when you know you've got a phenomenal business. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, sort of like the um, and the and the master settlement agreement too in the tobacco companies kind of telegraphed the same thing and gave them an advantage turn that they'll utilities. continue to enjoy. Yeah, turn made them it impossible utilities. to compete with them. Yeah, absolutely impossible. That's right. You don't start a new tobacco company, a right. new cigarette company in the United States of America. You just don't. So, you know, if Google can um, get some antitrust against it, then it's an absolute lock. That's the yeah, That's right. They, they, they keep <laughs> it's on threatening. Absolute, yeah, lots of threats I notice, but no nothing with any teeth in it, so and no action really. You know, despite some fines here and there. Um so yeah, I I agree. Uh they are they're pretty incredible businesses. Another one that I own that's always a little bit I think it's just a it's a weird one is Domino's. Uh, Domino's Pizza. I and right. when you look at Domino's, what it earns on assets, it earns more than Google, which you know that doesn't really make a lot of sense that no. uh, a company like that can do that. But of course, it's because it's a franchiser, and you don't have to have a lot of capital tied up in a franchise business. When I think about trends in society, I don't see pizzas. I don't see people eating fewer pizzas in the future than they do today. I think we're going to keep on eating more pizzas. Domino's mm -hmm. is. Um, very consistent. You get the same product essentially from any single store that you go to. My kids love it. They can have pizza for lunch and I'll say, what do you want for dinner? And they'll say pizza from Domino's. That would be the absolute pinnacle of, that would be the peak of their day if we could do that again. So there's clearly demand for it out there. It's the cheapest way to feed a family of four. I have a family of five. I assume it's, the, it's probably the cheapest way to feed a family of five as well. <laughs> I think it's one of those, it's, it's, it's a small, it's a $14 billion market cap. So it's not a very big, it's not a very big company. They've spent a lot of money buying back stock, but they've got some debt on their balance sheet as, as a result of doing that. I do think they can carry it. They've got lots of issues with inputs because when the Ukraine Russia war kicked off, that's one of the sources of grain for the world. So flour became expensive and they've got inflation problems. It's hard for them to get drivers all of these sort of things going on in that business. Mm -hmm. But I think that's why it's a good opportunity to buy it now. They take advantage of the weakness in the share price to buy back lots of stock and it's a very good business under the hood. I think it's um, too cheap and it's safe and the downside is very low. So Domino's is another sort of one that I like to hold. I have a, I have a fairly eclectic mix, but I tend to be at the, at the more broken down end than at the really great business available at a at a fair price, I'm more of a not so great business available at a very cheap price kind of investor. Wow. Okay. Um, I mean, is there one of those that you can talk about or? Well, just the, the you know, so I've, I own two coal companies, Arch Resources. Okay. And um, I think that the, everybody knows the issues with coal. When it's burned, it releases carbon dioxide. So the ESG guys don't like it. Um, but we're not getting away from coal anytime soon either. I uh, don't think there are many coal mines that are going to be opened up. So the ones that already have them are pretty good bets and they're over-earning. You get them for one or two times operating income at the moment. So I think mm -hmm. they're very cheap. And so I put them with my energy companies there. I know what the problem is with them. Everybody knows what the problem is with them. 
they're over earning. I mean, they're they're earning more than they were. They're, I think they're they're not over earning yet, but I think they'll they'll over earn at some point through the cycle, and I think they'll get a multiple to match when they over earn. So I I think they're reasonably safe bets. Energy and those kind of resources companies. Just look up the name. I can't believe I can't think what that name is. A oh, warrior Met. A oh, warrior Met. Yeah. Yeah. So and Met Coal is a different animal. All right. Well, cool. Um, we've actually been talking for a while here, so maybe I'll just get on to my final question, which is the same for every guest, no matter what the topic. I think I think this is, this is like the third or fourth time that you're answering this. And this question is simply, if you could leave our listeners with a single thought today, what would it be? I think value has had a very rough run, an unusually rough run for the last 10, 12 years and I think that I, I say value is in the, the 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 less good businesses that you have to buy at a big discount, that the kind of handicapping type investment, rather than ones where you're buying and you're expecting them to to be so much bigger and to grow so substantially into the future that you can just about pay any price. I think that that style of investment has suffered over the last decade, and I think that the conditions are very good right now for that style of investment into the future. And I think if you look at historical periods of time that have looked like this one that we're going into, and I think that that's like a 66 going into the 70s or a 69 going into the 70s, 99 Mm -hmm. going into the early 2000s, I think that fundamental old school value investment is just about to have, it's about to show everybody why it's such an enduring strategy because it has these periods of massive outperformance when there's basically no other options around. And so I'm very excited for it. And I think that folks should pay attention to it, get on it as early as they can. Well said. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> talking my book. Here, I'm talking my book. Yep, but uh, I, of course. But my book is yeah. where it is because that's what I think and not the other way around. There you go. Of course. That, you know, I want you to talk your book of all people. Of course. Yes. And thank you for it, man. And uh, thanks for being here again. I always enjoy talking with you. Likewise, Dan. Thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Many mainstream analysts are predicting that stocks will recover soon. But I say we'll instead witness a cash frenzy unlike we've experienced in 21 years before stocks recover. And I'm urging Americans not to buy a single stock until they see it. I predicted the Lehman Brothers crash in 2008, and I called the top of the NASDAQ in 2021. But this, this is the number one most important thing to pay attention to for 2023. And I'm not talking about another market crash or politics or inflation or any of these other things. As all this unfolds, the financial consequences of what I'm talking about could last for several decades if you don't understand what's happening. There will be winners and losers. And now is the time to decide which one you'll be. This is why I strongly encourage you to read about my warning totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together. Get the facts yourself. Go to www.stockdeadzone.com to get your free copy of this report. You can learn how to get my four steps to prepare for what's coming. Again, that's www.stockdeadzone for a free copy of this new report. Well, I always enjoy talking with my friend Toby Carlisle, partly because I know that he is a very strict, bottom-up, value-oriented kind of a guy, especially when things are changing a lot and, and markets are changing. And of course, we've had what I believe is the beginning of an ongoing bear market. Some people think the bear market is over. Uh, I always want to know, have, have you changed anything? Are you doing anything different? And he's not. He just sticks to his guns because he knows he's in it for the long term and he knows the strategy works long term. And I, so, I, you know, I always want to know what he's got to say. I like his views on oil. I like his views on coal. Um, and on the banks, we're, we're pretty close, I think. Um, I think we would both buy them under certain circumstances. And right now, it's just not quite good enough. But it's, it's time to start looking at them. You know, I'd want to, for example, we mentioned M&T Bank. I want to start looking at them now and hopefully things get, <laughs> this is terrible to say, but hopefully things get worse, you know, and, and if we're right about a recession coming and, you know, if 
just people stop spar- borrowing. I mean, if people stop spending or slow down in their spending, it means they slow down in their borrowing too. So banks could potentially get cheaper and more attractive. Um, anyway, great guy, smart guy, highly disciplined, value-oriented investor. He's going to be a regular feature on this show every several months or so. So get used to hearing from him. And uh, I really enjoyed just talking with him anyway, because he's a great guy. So that's another interview. And that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com. Click on the episode you want. Scroll all the way down. Click on the word transcript and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody who might like it, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at investorhour.com. Do me a favor too. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want me to interview? Drop us a note at feedback at InvestorHour.com or call the listener feedback line 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my co-host, Corey McLaughlin, till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email, feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansbury Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.